graph, the graph. There's a graph. Uh, Audio. Yeah. yeah. It, it's. I, oh. Michelle, <laughs> remember, it was working before we reset. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I could try and talk super loudly. I can wait. I don't, I don't mind. This is like my meditation calm down time. <laughs> you can talk about your cats again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's all about the that Python 3.2 once. That means only available yeah. for so Python 3 and up, like a 2.7 license. Correct. Um, so I use Python too, so I really haven't gotten to play around with it much, but it looks really cool. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's been back for as well. Oh, it has. Yes. Oh, since when? Uh, don't know, but, uh, oh, cool. Well, thank you. I did not know that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, what was that last thing? Oh, okay. Awesome. Thank you. I was hoping I'd learn something new today. <laughs> <laughs> How's your voice? Uh, it's, it's pretty good. Is this loud enough? What, show of hands. Who, who wants to get on with the show? <laughs> there you go. On. Oh, okay. Um, so this was the graph I was uh, mentioning earlier. Um, it shows a few different scenarios and the um, accuracy of Redis's LRU implementation in different versions and with different values set for the max memory samples configuration directive. Um, so in each of these four instances, the cache was 100% full and then 50% more keys were added. Each little dot or pixel represents a key and the ones closest to the top were accessed least recently the ones closer to the bottom were accessed most recently. So in the theoretical LRU, we see exactly what we'd expect. The cache was, uh, oh, I should probably explain first. The light gray band represents keys that were evicted from the cache. Dark gray band represents keys that were not evicted. And the green band represents keys that were just added. So in the theoretical implementation, we see what we'd expect. The cache was 100% full, and when 50% more keys were added, the oldest half of the cache was evicted. In Redis 3.0, which is this top right one, uh, with the memory, uh, or sorry, the max memory samples set to 10, we get pretty close to that. Um, down in Redis 2.8 with max memory samples set to 5, which is what I'm actually using, you do run the risk of having some of your newly added keys evicted. Um, so again, if you don't mind using more memory in your Redis instance uh, for this LRU implementation, you can set that value higher. Um, so before I was that, here's memcached. All right, uh, so next we'll talk about when you should and should not cache. Um, one of the first scenarios you might run into with your own application, uh, if your application is dependent on external API calls with a slow response time, there's really not too much you can do on the external end, but caching the data from the API calls uh, could help save you and your user time on average. Um, also, if you're using an external API, uh, depending on what tier you're signed up for, they might rate limit you. Um, so caching the data and and storing it on your own server can help you avoid uh, your call limits. But please only do this if you're allowed to. It's really easy to check the terms and conditions of the API you're using. So for example, LinkedIn's API was the first one that I found really maintain within your own application. Um, caching can help alleviate database load. Um, and if you know that you have a lot of endpoints that are hit very frequently, um, caching those could also help save your users time and improve user experience. Um, also, if your endpoints aren't, if the data returned by your API endpoints is not updated very frequently, you could take advantage of caching there. Uh, when it gets 
gets to the point where your data is updated very frequently, you run the risk of returning stale data to your users. So in some applications, it doesn't matter too much. But if it does, then you need to start worry, worrying about invalidating your cache um, so that you're not serving that stale data. And it's kind of up to each, each user, each use case, uh, to decide when you hit the point that you're not really achieving any benefit from caching anymore. Um, so when should you totally avoid a caching solution? Or maybe when would you be encouraged to avoid a caching solution? If your application is already fast, there is only so much that Redis or some other caching solution can do to speed up your calls. So if your code is already really fast, good for you, you probably don't need to use caching. Um, caching doesn't come for free. There is some added code complexity and uh, you're going to have to worry about maintaining it on your servers. So if adding a layer of caching is going to make your code more fragile or unmaintainable, first step would probably be clean up your code base instead of just slapping caching on top of it. Um, it's important to remember that saving your users some time probably isn't going to be worth all the time you're going to have to deal with fixing bugs. Um, and if you have concerns about persistence. So Redis does offer persistence built in. If you don't want to set that up or if you're using another caching option that doesn't offer data persistence, uh, don't use a cache to store that data. Uh, there's a chance that you're going to lose it and you should really only be caching data that you don't mind losing and having to rebuild. Um, also, if you can just optimize your database instead, please try that first. This is really hypocritical of me. My demo is supposed to be super simple, so there are a lot of database optimizations I could have made, but I didn't want to totally invalidate the need for using Redis because it would have made my demo really boring. Um, so apologies to my DBA friend, Brian, if you are going to be watching this at some point in the future, I'm sorry for what I did. Um, but for the rest of you, Please check your slow query logs, uh, use explain or explain analyze on your queries to see why they're running slow, or why they're running slowly. Um, if you can add an index that'll bring a query down from, you know, 700 milliseconds to 3 milliseconds, then do that. It's going to be way easier than implementing caching. Um, also, if you are completely reliant on the ORM in whatever web framework you might be using, and if you've never outputted the SQL that gets compiled when you use the ORM, shame on you. Do that. Sometimes it does really stupid stuff that you wouldn't even imagine, and writing a raw query might totally speed up that call. Um, so, oh, bummer. I had emojis there, but I guess, ah, whatever. Um, so just to summarize all that, the pros of caching, obviously, faster access to your cache data, uh, less in DB load, uh, faster external API calls, the ability to avoid rate limiting, which is always good. Um, cons, uh, added code complexity and cache invalidation blues, so what I was talking about earlier with the possibility of serving stale data to your users and potentially some debugging complications. All right, so now I'm going to start the demo. Um, so the first thing that you'd want to do, and that I actually had to do, is get Redis installed. Um, that's really easy to do. Uh, if you have a package manager, you can use that. Or um, you can just grab the source from the Redis download page. Uh, it's really easy to get it installed from source there. Um, when you jump into the SRC directory in uh, Redis, it gives you... Oh, oh I'm sorry. Can, can you guys see that? A little better? Bigger? Good? Okay. Um, uh, what was I saying? Uh, da, da, da. Oh, so if you uh, jump into the source directory, um, that's where you'll find the commands Redis server and Redis CLI. Redis server is going to start up the server for you, and Redis CLI is going to drop you in the command line interpreter. Um, let's see. Give me just a sec. 
Um, so when you start up uh, Redis, like if you were to just run the Redis server command, it would start up with the default configuration. This is um, only recommended to use for testing. What you'd want to do is set up your own um, Redis config file. Um, it, it's commonly called redis.config. And that's where you would store you know, passwords, uh, what ports you want to access on, um, master-slave replication information, uh, whether or not you want Redis to daemonize, etc. Um, so I am going to give you a quick peek. Let's see if I can make this bigger. So this is my own demo redis.conf file. Um, I've set the max memory, max memory samples, and the max memory policy configuration directives. So uh, max memory policy is what's actually going to handle key eviction in Redis. Um, I have set mine to all keys LRU, which basically means uh, when the cache fills up completely, Redis is going to take a subset of all the keys and then uh, evict the least recently used ones. Um, other policy settings include no eviction, which is just going to return an error if you fill up the um, if you fill up the cache to the max memory size. Volatile LRU, um, so if any of your keys have an expire set, so if you've set them with a time to live, Redis will evict the least recently accessed key with an expire set. Um, all keys random and volatile random will evict random keys. And volatile TTL will evict the keys with uh, will evict the key with the least time to live. Um, so I've started up Redis server and I've passed it. Uh, you pass in the path to your Redis configuration file. Um, and here, I'll make this a little bigger. Um, so when you run Redis CLI, it drops you into this little command line interpreter. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick demo of how you would interact with the Redis server inside the CLI. Is that big enough for everyone to see? I can go a little bigger. Um, so most basic things, setting a string key to a string value. Um, the commands are not case sensitive, but the keys obviously will be. So we have my key and we're setting it to my value. Okay, uh, if we want to get the value of that key, we just use the get command. All right, um, if we want to delete that key, we use the del command. So for this command, Redis is returning one. That means it found the key and it was able to delete it. If we try to get it again, it won't return anything. And if we try to delete it again, Redis will return zero. Um, another thing that might be handy, uh, even though we're using Redis um, as an LRU cache, and the least recently accessed keys are going to be evicted, so we probably don't need to set a time to live on any of our keys. But if you wanted to, you could use the setx command, which takes in a key, a time to live, and a value. So when we run time to live and pass in that key, it's going to return the integer number of seconds uh, before that key expires. All right. And flush all is just going to flush the cache completely. Um, so now I'm going to give you a quick run through of this Flask application that we're going to be running. Um, I think we're doing okay on time. I'm yeah. okay. I might run through this a little quickly. Um, so if you've never used Flask, I definitely recommend looking at the docs. It's a really simple, bare, ba uh, bare bones web framework. Um, the docs actually refer to it as a micro framework because you can essentially keep your entire application in one file. Uh, you might not want to do that, but for a demo, it's perfect. Um, so I'm just going to fire this up real quick, and we'll see what it returns. Um, make this a little bigger. It's like a... Okay, so we run this oop, with Python, file name, project.py, and 
and oh, I already have it running. That's what you were trying to say. <laughs> I'm just gonna kill this. Okay, so over here we'll run it. Alright, so by default this is going to run locally on port 5000. So let's see what this looks like. So this is our little uh, web application. Uh, now let's dive into the code that's actually run or that we're actually running right now. Uh, is this big enough? Sorry, not big enough. Is this big enough? Awesome. Uh, sorry for anyone that's vision impaired. I totally understand. Um, so this is our project.py file. Here's where we're actually uh, creating our Flask application object. We're passing it some configuration and we're setting up a connection to uh, the SQL Alchemy ORM. Flask doesn't actually have a built-in ORM, but it has a really handy um, extension, which I think I have imported somewhere. Um, oh yeah, the uh, Flask SQL Alchemy extension, which makes it really easy to hook into that if you want to use that to communicate with your database. Um, so down here at the bottom is where we're actually calling run on our application. We have debug set to true, um, which is really handy if you're developing. Uh, if your code bugs out for whatever reason, it opens or uh, Flask will return the uh, some handy traceback information, um, and it also gives you a console um, in the browser so you can interact with the code. So this is why you never want to have debug set to true in a production environment. Um, it would give any random person potentially the ability to just execute arbitrary code on your server, which doesn't sound fun for me. I don't know. Maybe for you. Um, <laughs> living on the edge. Um, all right. So here's our index page that we saw earlier, returning hello world here. Um, this app.route decorator is telling Flask that whenever we hit the base URL, so just slash, we're going to run this index function. Um, we're not using a template here, we're just returning a string. Flask is smart enough to know that if you return a string, it's just going to render that in the browser as is. Um, for more complicated um, uh, sorry, for more complicated routes, if you do need to use a template, which you probably will, the default templating language in Flask is Jinja. So if you've ever used Django or the Django templating language, you'd be totally fine switching to Jinja. It does a lot of the same stuff, but right out of the box, Jinja lets you do a lot more like Python functionality inside your template. So it's pretty cool. Um, so for a more interesting route, uh, right here we have... Oops, Right here we have slash recipe and slash recipe ID. Um, so this is telling Flask that when we hit this URL, we're going to check to see if a recipe ID is present in the URL. If it is, we're going to use the SQL Alchemy connection to grab that recipe from the database or 404 if the ID can't be found. If <laughs> Um, if there is no ID present in the URL, we're just going to return the first 100 recipes ordered by rating. Um, and then we're going to render this template, which I will give you a peek of now. Um, so this is recipe.html. Actually, I'll, I'll show it to you real quick. Uh, let's hit slash recipe. Oop. Don't want to zoom in on that. All right. <laughs> so we have a couple search bars and a bunch of recipes all listed out. And if we look on our template, uh, we have some JavaScript that is handling the search bars. I'm actually using the jQuery UI uh, autocomplete plugin to make a nice little autocomplete drop down because I was too lazy to write my own. Um, and we have our search bars here. The one on the left is posting to slash search slash recipe. And the one on the right is posting to, if I can zoom, oh, sorry, this is wrapping around, uh, slash search slash search cache slash recipe. Really should have thought these names out a little better. Um, 
end down here is where we're actually looping through all of our recipes, printing out the name, rating, prep time, cook time, ingredients, and instructions. So this is all pretty standard. <laughs> um, so the demo is actually going... Is my mic back on? Yeah. Oh, cool. I'll stop shouting at all of you. Um, so the demo is actually going to revolve around these search these search bars up here. Um, I don't know if you could tell by the URLs that I'm using, but one of these search bars is hooked up to use uh, no cache, and one is hooked up to use our Redis cache. Um, let's jump in here. Oh, and. and I think I mentioned it earlier, if you want to grab the Redis Python module, it's just pip install Redis. Uh, do, 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 do. So let's scroll down here, and here we can see our route, oh, slash, slash search slash recipe. This is getting really hard to say. Um, so this search function is just going to return a base search function, and we're going to pass in the search term that we're using slash search cache slash recipe is going to return the same base search function, but we're passing in the cache parameter set to true. So taking a look at base search, we are building our query here. Um, so we're basically selecting every column from this recipe database, and we're using the Postgres like operator to see if our query is similar um, to the name or ingredients of any of the recipes in our database. Uh, an index would have made this really, really fast. So again, sorry Brian, but I don't want my demo to be terrible. Um, down here is where we're creating our Redis object, and it, we, if we have cache set to true, so if we're using the search cache route, um, we're gonna try to grab the result from cache. If we can't find it, or if we're not using caching, we're just gonna fall back on the database. Gonna run this query. Um, the query is, I already said it's using the like operator and with the percent on either side so it's not left or right anchored. So chicken, I think I have it right here, chicken will match chicken soup, fried chicken, or barbecue chicken wings. I print out the query for some debugging, we execute the query, um, we return all the rows and render it in a template, or if we have caching set to true before we return that template, uh, we're going to set the cache key, which is going to be our search term, mapped to the entire result of that database call. So let's see how this works. Uh, okay. Um, so. So if we just search chicken here, you can see our timing down here, like 236 milliseconds, cool. Um, right now our cache is totally empty, so we're getting about the same time. But now if we check our server, so all of our keys that start with cache and uh, match this pattern. So now we have some of these in our cache. So if we try to search for this again, should return a little bit faster. So that's cool. Um, let's use our non-cache search bar. Addictive sesame chicken. So returning this single recipe takes about 120 milliseconds. That's not bad, uh, but we can do better. First time a user is going to search for this uh, when it's not in cache. Should take about the same time. But let's try it one more time. Do we have any guesses for how fast this is going to be? No? 60 milliseconds? 10 milliseconds. 2 milliseconds. Yeah, so that's a lot faster. So sorry your first user is maybe going to notice a blip in, your in their browser, but the second user is not going to, and every user after that. Um, all right, so let's try to search for something that I'm a little more interested in. Skyline. Eh, we've got nothing. Um, so let's add a Skyline recipe. Skyline chili. Blah, this doesn't matter. It's going to be delicious. I'm going to give it a rating of 6 <laughs> so it shows up at the top of our search results. In a normal web application, I'm sure a user wouldn't be able to set their own rating for the recipe, but whatever. 
Okay, so let's see. Skyline Chili, cool. Let's see how fast it is with cash. Does anyone know why it didn't show up? We already cached the result of the previous query, which returned like an empty string from our database because Skyline didn't exist. Um, so now a user is getting stale data. If they weren't using the cache search bar, they would see this new Skyline recipe, but it would take a little bit longer. If they are using the cache uh, search view, they would get a response really quickly, but it would have no information in it. Don't worry though, I handled this contingency. Um, I wrote a handy little flush cache. Flush cache method. Um, so this flush stale method will take in the name of our new recipe and the ingredients of our new recipe. It will grab every chunk of the name of this recipe because as we type we're making a request basically for each letter so we're kind of caching each search term with another letter added onto it. So this flush stale method will grab all of those, make a list of those keys, um, and then we use this handy Redis pipeline function. Um, pipeline basically means uh well, let's, let's look here. We're looping through a bunch of keys. So if we were just to call Redis delete on each of these keys in a loop, it would be a request to the server, we'd wait for a response. Request to the server, we'd wait to the response. Uh, wait for the response. Um, if you don't have a lot of keys, it's probably not gonna take super long. If you do have a lot of keys, uh, you're probably gonna wanna do this in a more efficient way. So using Redis pipelining, um, you can call this command on each of these keys, execute all the commands in the pipeline, and then you're only going to wait for one response to come back. So it saves you, uh, saves you on round trip time. So now that we have our flush stale method in action, let's add another one. Skyline chili dip, which is also delicious. And we're going to give it a rating of nine. I really like Skyline. <laughs> um, okay, so 139 milliseconds to get that. Do, 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 do. Yay, 142 milliseconds because we just flushed the cache. Um, but let's try to actually post this and we get the results in three milliseconds. So that's pretty exciting. Every time a user is going to use this autocomplete bar, they're populating the cache for the inevitable moment when they post to the search bar to try and get um, actual results back. Um, and I'm flustered. I think that's everything I wanted to talk about today. Uh, are there any, are, are we, I think we're in the question and answer round. Um, are there any questions? Any more questions? Yes? I was just curious when you said you were saving like every letter. I know it said it was actually like chai and then chicken. So it wasn't every letter, so are you, you're not doing like a key press down, but it's more like... It, it's on key up, but I think um, I was probably typing too fast, and the way jQuery UI autocomplete, it probably wasn't making a request for each key as I typed really fast. If I do type a little more slowly. Yeah, I was just, I was yeah. just I wasn't missing. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. yeah, so when I actually type that out very slowly, um, we can get all of our keys and see that CHI, C yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, let me get the mic to you first. Oh. Um, do you ever use Redis as a write cache um, or only ever as a read cache? Um, it's up to you. I mean, I, like for my use case, we would want any user interaction to write to the cache so they'd be able to read that data back later. But uh, like, uh, well, I guess what I'm asking is like, um, if you write to the cache from like the user side, you eventually have to kind of flush it to your actual database at some point. And I'm wondering um, if you if you use it for that purpose and and how you kind of handle that. Oh, you mean to like. Like if I wanted to push this all to like Postgres or something? Yeah, like if you're that. like adding a recipe, instead of writing it to the database, write it to the cache first and then flush it at a later point. Gotcha. Um, so I probably forgot to point this out. Um, when we hit this uh, view with cache set to true, um, oh wait, I'm sorry, up here when we're actually adding a recipe, we are saving that to the database. Um, 
and then flushing the cache. So I'm using Postgres to persist this data. I don't have my Redis instance set up now to persist it. I could, and then could maybe just get rid of the need for Postgres altogether, but it's nice to have it as a fail safe, so. Yes. Uh, during your examples, you had the situation where we cached a blank value and there was basically bad data and everything. I mean, could you just not cache something if you're searching for something that's not in the database? Is it, would that be a valid solution? Absolutely. Um, it really comes down to how quickly you think that data is going to be updated. Um, and if you have like a time to live set, like so an expire time set on your keys and you think your data will probably not be updated super often, so you have your keys maybe flush out or expire once a day, then that kind of takes care of this problem. But yeah, it's really up to the user uh, what data you actually want to push to the cache. Anything right. else? Um, okay. I guess this is more of a tip than a question because I've, I've done a lot of stuff like this. Oh, um, okay. And when you start caching more complex keys, you're really tempted to like write a decorator like that thing that's in Funk Tools and put it all in all your methods and they all get magically cached. And then you realize you're caching things like dictionaries and sets, mm -hmm. and you have to be very careful when you're constructing your keys to uh, make your make your key serialization consistent. So if you look at like the implementation of that Funk Tools thing uh, somebody mentioned earlier, well, I guess you mentioned it first, right? It will go through and sort stuff and make it all very uh, nice and consistent, and then throw MD5 at it or another hash function so your keys don't get gargantuan. Mm -hmm. Because once you get to the point, like some of these caches are really, really fast, and your serialization overhead can dominate like you know the the performance of the cache uh, and so you've got to be careful about all that stuff Oh, I do have one question. Yes. So I've done this with memcached a lot. Uh -huh. Memcached has a value limit, like the size of the value you store can't be bigger than like a megabyte or something. Does Redis have that or is it just like all of RAM? Like I <sighs> I'm trying to remember. I know I read the the Redis docs like 30 times before I came here, but nervousness, my brain just like sure, jumped yeah. all of that information. Um, I'm pretty sure there is a default value size, but I think you can configure what that actually is. Okay, cool. um, but also using something like a hash, depending on what your use case is, or maybe a set or a list, like one of Redis's data structures. I'm just using strings. Those can get really big. Um, using a hash or one of the other data structures can actually help you reduce the size and memory of your cache. So yeah, thank you. Cool. Thanks for the talk. It was really good. Thank um, you. <laughs> so you mentioned you glossed over the Postgres indexing. Did you do any tests to see what the time is, and is it comparable? Or um, maybe my database is really simple, as you saw. I'm not joining on any tables. My query is really simple. Um, I think the first index I threw in there was returning data in about three milliseconds. So it's like, oh, just uh, we'll do this. We'll pretend this is a really complex, you know, situation where you can't optimize any further. And yeah, but f like if this is your application, like I said earlier, don't use caching. You can make it a lot faster with an index. Okay, one last question. This kind of isn't a question either, but it's an address to the right cache because mm -hmm. um, I've used uh, Redis in that application. Oh, okay. Um, I was taking machine data and storing it on a local machine before pushing it to a cloud service. And um, it's pretty interesting. It works really well, and I was using it in kind of a worker flow. So I would take data, put it on Redis with persistence turned on, and then if that device lost internet connectivity, it would just sit in the cache and keep pushing data to the cache and then when it gained internet connectivity again a worker would pull it off the cache and push it and you use a list type to manage your queues I mean it's pretty neat Redis is really cool yeah thanks for the talk thanks for being patient with all the technical issues and just pushing through oh not a problem I was you know looking throughout my notes and trying to re-memorize everything so I appreciate the bit of a bit of a delay <laughs> yeah let's give Lindsay a round of applause thank you Uh, 
um, yeah, sorry again for all the all the trouble. We should have used Reddit for audio and video, <laughs> and it would have come up a lot faster. Um, <laughs> and again, if you have more questions, feel free to um, talk to Lindsay. I'm sure she'll be happy to talk to you. And thanks for coming. <laughs>